All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, glad you're hanging out now through the end of Balticon. And as people come in, I see participant number is still going up a bit. Uh, it is great to see people are you know still attending. Um, good afternoon, if it is afternoon where you are. It is where I am. And um, this particular very cold and rainy uh, Memorial Day weekend has turned into a sunnier and, and, and warmer uh, Memorial Day itself. And Brood X is going strongly and they're, they're singing out there. So that's great. All right, so uh, hopefully you are in the right room. And that room would be the Homeland Room uh, for the science programming and my presentation on Charles Darwin, Fossil Hunter. Um, I'm Dr. Tom Holtz. I'm a paleontologist at the University of Maryland. And I also have a research affiliate position with the National Museum of Natural History. And here is my professional um, email address and my Twitter handle. So I work uh, primarily on dinosaurs. And I know that sounds like a an, uh, being redundant. Uh, but in fact, the vast majority of paleontologists don't work on dinosaurs, but I do. In fact, I specifically work on carnivorous dinosaurs and even more specifically than that, my primary focus is, is on tyrannosauroids like T-Rex here. And I do, uh, don't just work in museums. I do get out in the field to work on specimens and collect new ones. Um, this is at a site in southeastern Montana that I've been working for since 2013. Wow, is that right? Um, and wasn't able to go last year. And we're trying to see if we're going to be able to get uh, get out there this summer. Um, so yeah, I work on you know the bones of giant animals, but I work in all sorts of paleontology. And as an educator, uh, I teach lots of aspects of geology and evolutionary biology and climate change and a number of other things. And of course, one big aspect of all of that is the works of Charles Darwin. So um, Darwin, we know mostly in our popular culture as the uh, quote unquote discoverer of evolution, although that's strictly speaking not true. Other people had postulated evolution long before him. Uh, he was the co-discoverer of evolution by means of natural selection um, and, you know, Typically, we picture him as, as this bearded old man, um, and which of course he eventually was, but when he made his discoveries, he most certainly was not. And we tend to associate him primarily with issues of biology. Um, however, it's worth noting that Darwin himself considered himself in his early career as a geologist. Um, and he, when he was a student, there wasn't really a professional field called biology. That term had only been used in a couple of um, instances in the professional literature at that point. Instead, he would have considered himself a, a geologist, and that's simply part of the larger context of being a natural historian. And it's worth noting that in the opening of On the Origin of Species, by far his most famous and influential book, um, the very first sentence refers primarily to issues concerning geology and fossils. So here it is, I'm gonna expand it up. Um, when on board HMS Beagle as naturalist, I was much struck with certain facts in the distribution of the inhabitants and in the geological relations of the past inhabitants of that continent. In other words, in the very first sentence of the origin, he makes reference to fossil organisms. Um, and then these facts seem to me to throw some light on the origin of species, that mystery of mysteries, as it has been called by one of our greatest philosophers. Now, you know, people don't always pay all the attention um, to uh, uh, oh, why am I not wearing a Darwin jacket? Yeah, <laughs> I, I actually, I've got a dinosaur jacket. I do not actually have a Darwin jacket. Um, so, oh, I do have my uh, Charles Darwin, um, uh, the uh, Pirate of the Galapagos jacket that I wore at Balticon about 10 years ago. And that's over in another room. Okay, so um, this phrase, the mystery of mysteries, you know, what is he talking about here? Well, that actually comes from the work of this gentleman, and I mean that actually in a, in a precise 
term, um, Sir John Frederick William Herschel, uh, first baronet, uh, the son of one of the most famous astronomers of um, the previous generation and himself a famous scientist and natural historian at the time. And this uh, Herschel had written a letter to the geologist Charles Lyell, who would eventually, who was one of the most inf influential uh, thinkers in terms of Darwin's understanding of the world and eventually was one of Darwin's close allies. And in this letter to Lyell, uh, which was discussing Charles Lyell's principles of geology, and this letter itself was published in part in one of the Bridgewater treatises, uh, which was a series of writings published at the time, this particular volume by Babbage, yes, that Babbage, computer Babbage. And the specific line in reference is, of course, I allude to that mystery of mysteries, the replacement of extinct species by others. And I like to point out this fact to my biology colleagues. Herschel is not merely talking about what is speciation. That is not his question. He is specifically addressing the question, what is the reason for fossil succession? He is talking about a question in paleontology and geology and not merely in biology. So what do I mean by fossil succession? Well, in the late 17 and early 1800s, it was becoming apparent that fossils were the remains not merely of dead organisms, but of dead unknown and in fact extinct organisms that they represented forms which are not present in the modern world. And so what I show here are, is a representation of fossil species uh, that would have been known at the turn of the century, as in, uh, in 1800, um, that Darwin and others would have known when they were growing up. You know, dinosaurs weren't on the table yet. A couple species of dinosaurs would be named uh, while Darwin was a young person, but Dinosauria wouldn't be named until long after the voyage of the Beagle. But we've got, you know, Pterodactylus, the woolly mammoth, uh, Megatherium, and we'll get to Megatherium. It's going to play a role in this story, which was the most famous fossil animal to come out of South America at that time. Uh, Plesiosaurus, discovered by the famous uh, fossil hunter uh, Mary Anning, and Anoplotherium, uh, discovered and described by Georges Cuvier, the sort of father of vertebrate paleontology. And I wanna point out, this is an earliest 1800s or latest 1700s drawing. And yet, if, you know, this is on a quality, on a par with some of the better work that was done at the dawn of the 20th century. So some of these researchers were also extremely skilled artists. And it had been apparent, to, especially in the context of work by Cuvier and uh, around the same time work being done by William Strata Smith in Great Britain and so forth, that fossil organisms didn't just exist in the past, that it wasn't a prehistoric world, but rather that there was a succession of prehistoric worlds, one after another, after another, after another. So where did the inhabitants of each of these worlds come from? Were they a, success, a succession of separate creations that really didn't seem to fit into uh, any reasonable theology at the time? You know, would God create a bunch of organisms and then get bored and tired with them, wipe them out and create a bunch of new ones? Or, or traveled the world, would we actually find some of these creatures still existing in, in some other spot? And so we'll just see migration. Well, that didn't pan out. So instead, people began to speculate that fossil organisms included the ancestors or even the early relatives, but maybe not direct ancestors of later forms. So that's the context in which um, Darwin was studying and eventually thinking about as he began to travel the world. Now, Charles Darwin himself is born in uh, 1809. Um, he was the son of very wealthy, uh, of a very wealthy family. His grandfather, uh, Erasmus Darwin, who himself actually was one of the early thinkers in terms of evolution and transmutation of species, um, had been a, uh, a famous doctor, had even helped um, 
as a, as a doctor to uh, George III, uh, King of England. Uh, Darwin's father, Robert, uh, was a famous doctor, although didn't do too much in the realm of, of natural history as such. And if you want to picture uh, Darwin's family and their sort of uh, their position in life, think of some of the richer families you might see in a Jane Austen novel that gets you about the right time and about the right social class, not the nobility or the aristocracy, but people who are definitely very well off. Well, Darwin, as an undergraduate, um, explored the possibility of becoming a medical doctor as his father did and as his older brother started to do. Uh, but it turned out uh, when Darwin went off to the University of Edinburgh uh, to study medicine, it turned out he got violently ill at the sight of human suffering and blood. <laughs> and, um, and of course, given the nature of, of this is long before anesthetics, um, surgeries were performed on people who were conscious and awake um, and screaming, uh, he couldn't stand it. And so he said he'd have to revisit um, what his career would be. He didn't want to just turn into a, uh, uh, you know, a rich upper class twit, which is actually the career that his older brother eventually did, which was no career whatsoever. Um, and instead, he thought back and said his favorite classes, and, or rather his famous favorite experiences at Edinburgh, had been classes in natural history. And as a, as a young kid, he collected bugs and rocks and so forth. So he thought, is there a way that he can make natural history his, his living. Well, in consultation with other faculty members, with the faculty members at Edinburgh, they said, well, you could study to be a parson. You could study to be a member of the clergy. Because, you know, basically, you know, six days a week, you're not working. And in fact, many of the great natural historians of the time were in the clergy. Now, Darwin himself did not come from a religious family. Uh, his, his grandfather was famously atheistic. His father wasn't so adamant about that, but was a, a Unitarian. But nevertheless, uh, Darwin thought if this is the pathway that can let him study bugs and rocks and fossils and bees and so forth, uh, then so be it. And so he went to Cambridge University, uh, to Christ College, where at Christ College today, they have this reconstruction uh, this um, sculpture of him with his books as he would appear at the time. And in fact, his old dorm room has been restored to the appearance of it was as, as it was at the time. At, before I got to, to see the room, when I was on a tour with this, I, I joked, had they put up his old posters? And in fact, they did. Uh, or rather, they could, uh, what the undergraduates at the time would uh, do is they would check prints out from some of the museums uh, on campus and hang them on their wall. And there were records of what prints he had used. So yeah, basically we've got his old posters on the wall. Um, so he studied lots and lots of natural historian, uh, uh, lots of natural history in his um, researches uh, as an undergraduate and planned on doing something expedition wise when he graduated. Now, it turned out his initial plans fell through, but uh, in the immediate aftermath of his graduation, he had opportunity to work with one of his uh, teachers, um, Adam Sedgwick, one of the great figures in the early days of geology, on doing actual geologic mapping. So in geologic mapping, that's one of the most fundamental aspects of the earth sciences we do. That's finding out what bodies of rock are present at different spots. And that helps us understand the relationships of the strata of the layers of rock, which can then reveal aspects of change through time. So here we see part of the map that he was working on and some of the projects that they worked on over this, this summer uh, was mapping out uh, in England and primarily in Wales, rocks of what we now call the Devonian um, period. And in fact, it's around this time that people like Sedgwick and his colleagues were beginning to break up earth history into these subdivisions. So as a young man, Charles Darwin helped contribute to some of the primary data used to help subdivide geologic time. And in fact, he referred, Dar Darwin referred to uh, 
this process of breaking up geologic time as the most sublime discovery of the genius of man. Now, he's writing this in 1838, and his own discoveries would, would very much sort of overtake uh, this sort of discovery. Um, but it's also worth noting uh, that I'm referring to things that are in his notebooks. One very nice aspect of this is that the writings of Darwin, um, while he was going around and sketching things and taking down notes and so forth, have survived to today. And his notebooks are all available digitally online. Um, you can read his notes, you can see his little doodles and so forth, and they help us understand his changing thinking as time went by. But of course, very famously, his big opportunity to do field work came with the voyage of the HMS Beagle. So the HMS Beagle was a British mapping vessel. It was sort of a new generation of ship and the uh, the main mission for the voyage that started in 1831 uh, was a mapping mission that was also going to test some of the newfangled longitude clocks. Some of you may know the story of the uh, discovery of how we could calculate longitude. Latitude was a relatively easy thing to work out astronomically. Uh, but longitude was a tricky aspect, and many, many researchers were trying to figure that out. Though, in fact, it was famously a big prize that was being offered for those who could solve the problem of calculating longitude. Well, people had worked out a method to do so, and the Voyage of the Beagle was going to, A, test this method, and also use it to help better map out the coastlines primarily of South America. Now, the captain of the ship was Robert Fitzroy. Robert Fitzroy was himself a scientist. He was a meteorologist and was the developer of basically uh, the weather forecast, how to take sets of meteorological observations for some particular region, like say the English Channel, and use past inferences to see what a particular set of conditions might mean for two days or three days or four days in the future. So, um, Fitzroy was looking to have a captain's companion on the ship, which you know sounds a little weird. You know, you can write your own slash fic about this if you want. Uh, but the idea of the captain's companion was the, the captains on these vessels tended to be from the higher rungs of British, of, of British society. But of course, almost everyone else on the ship was not. And so it was deemed inappropriate that a captain uh, would be uh, associating and fraternizing with people from lower standing on a regular basis, that they needed someone of their same station that they could talk about affairs and so forth with. Um, and so Fitzroy wanted to have the captain's companion um, filled by someone who could help serve as a ship's naturalist. Now, the ship's surgeon was also to serve as an, an official naturalist, but he wanted someone else on there as well. And uh, there was a process to go through, and Darwin was not at the top of the list, but he was third on the list, and the top two uh, candidates didn't make it, so he was able to go on this five-year mission. Um, and one of the gifts that Fitzroy gave to Darwin as he, when he accepted and arrived on the ship was the first volume of Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology which is a really foundational document in the science of geology. It was the strongest argument up until this point of the principle of what we call uniformitarianism. And that is the idea that the processes that we see operating in the world today are the same processes that existed in the past and that we can explain how rocks form and how fossils form and so forth from our observation of how the Earth is currently operate, operating. Um, and this is in contrast to other philosophies and theories of the Earth that had existed uh, in the previous century, uh, which did not think that we could take our modern observations and apply them to the ancient world, that other conditions operated. Well, uh, Fitzroy himself wasn't entirely committed to a, uh, a Lyellian view, but he knew it was something that 
that intellectuals were talking about and some scientists were treating seriously. Fitzroy by him, uh, incidentally, as his career would go on, became more and more of what we would now think of as a fundamentalist Christian. Although when he started, he hadn't gone quite as far as he would later on. Um, so uh, with this knowledge at hand and reading this, Darwin had a background now in geology that really set him capable of understanding how evolution could operate in ways that earlier generations, including his own grandfather, probably couldn't because they didn't understand the scale of Earth history, the scale of hundreds of millions of years. Um, and so it's hard to have the sort of mechanistic processes that we see operating in the world explain all the diversity of life if you only have a few thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. But when you have hundreds of millions of years or more, that makes sense. And in fact, from his notebooks, no one but a practiced geologist can really comprehend how old the world is, as the measurements refer not to the revolutions of the sun or our lives. So uh, here is the track of the voyage of the Beagle. But what this doesn't really show is how much back and forth was going, going on in the coastline of South America. They spent a, the better part of the voyage going back and forth and back and forth around South America, mapping out all the little fiddly bits on the coast. Um, and this also doesn't reflect something else. And that is, it turns out Darwin was not a good person on a ship he did not take to the three dimensions of motion on the sea as well as a sailor would. And so you know, he got basically, the, the joke is, you know, basically he walked onto the Beagle when it's in port in, in, in England and it goes immediately towards the other edge of the ship to go vomit. Now, I don't think that's actually accurate, but he, he did not like sea life that much. And so any opportunity they had to land, he would go and explore, um, in the interior. And that was part of the mission anyway, so that helped out. So we got to see the Amazonian rainforest, and it's a world entirely different than the south of England. And for the point of view of this lecture, he got to do a lot of work in southern South America, exploring the Andes and exploring the rocks and sediments of the Pampas region. And in fact, he made some of the first geologic cross sections of parts of the Andes. So as he was going up through these various passes, he was mapping out the bodies of rock and noting the inclination of the strata uh, and the position of fault lines and so forth and helped give the first set of knowledge of these interior structure of the Andes in a geological context rather than merely a topographic context. And in fact, many of these observations that he made and many of the discoveries that he'll talk about shortly get published in a series of volumes that were made after the return to England. So here are some of his sketches that he did of the cross sections of parts of the Andes. Also, while up in the mountains, he found many types of seashells, uh, primarily ones from what we would now call the Mesozoic era, the age of dinosaurs, and the earlier part of the Cenozoic era, the, the age of mammals, uh, that were there high up in sediments in the mountains. And, you know, this was not, it wasn't an entirely new discovery that you would find marine fossils up in mountains that have been known as long as people have been looking for fossils, but he was able to help document for the first time some of the Andean examples of this. Additionally, while on the what we now call the Chilean coast, um, he got to experience a major earthquake, one of the largest earthquakes of the 1800s, uh, where they saw part of the coastline up thrust up to 10 feet or more from where it had been before. And he writes how Fitzroy reported back from one beach, there were um, shells, barnacles, and mussels that were still stinking because they had just been exposed, you know, this is a week after the earthquake and they were at least 10 feet above the high tide mark. Um, and so this got him thinking about how the, given the great age of the earth, a series of small, from the point of view of earth history, but large from the point of view of a person at the time, earthquakes could lift material from sea level all the way up to a mountaintop and that the mountains indeed could be the result of the continued action 
of ordinary processes that we see operating in the world today. So sort of confirming the Lyellian view in his mind. But what I'm mostly gonna talk about now are some of his vertebrate fossil discoveries. So his megafaunal fossil discoveries in South America began with a megafossil, and that is specifically a specimen of megatherium. So, and he writes uh, in 1832, he's walking, uh, he walked on to Punta Alta to look after fossils because he had heard there were fossils in the area. And to my great joy, I found the head of some large animal embedded in the soft rock. It took me nearly three hours to get it out. As far as I'm able to judge, it is allied to the rhinoceros. Now, it's understandable that he would make this mistake. Darwin did not have a background in vertebrate paleontology yet because that as a discipline was very young. And indeed, Darwin did, didn't wind up describing most of his fossils. What happened with a lot of his collections, whether it's the fossils or the birds or the uh, rocks or whatever, is he would make meticulous notes about them as he found them. But then when the beagle returned to Great Britain, he would ship these specimens off to subject experts who then wrote up and described these fossils. And so in fact, when he sent this specimen off to uh, a person I'll talk, I'll introduce in the next slide, uh, Sir Richard Owen, Owen looked at them and said, aha, this is not the rhinoceros. This is in fact that strange creature of South America, Megatherium, that had been named in the previous century, the big beast. That's a sort of a simple name. Back then it was easy to come up with um, um, rather simple names because they hadn't been taken, the big beast of the Americas. It's a giant ground sloth. In fact, it is the giantest of giant ground sloths. And this specimen on display at the um, British Museum of Natural History, or rather the Natural History Museum of London, which was previously part of the British Museum, uh, part of their collection was. Part of their collection was actually part of a different museum I'll talk about later in this lecture. Uh, but it's now the Natural History Museum in London. This is the specimen based in part on the material that Darwin recovered. Now he didn't find an entire skeleton, so they had to sort of fill in the gaps. So the scientist who described the specimen for him and, and identified it is this gentleman. And again, I use that term in the Victorian sense, Sir Richard Owen, uh, one of the great anatomists of the, of the 19th century, although he made some amazing blunders later in his career uh, due to his conviction that humans and, um, and the great apes were highly separate from each other. Uh, but Sir Richard Owen did many things. He described one of the first specimens of Archaeopteryx, the early bird ever discovered. He named Dinosauria, the dinosaurs. Uh, he demonstrated the existence of the moa as an extinct, recently extinct form of giant bird. And in fact, in this painting, he's holding on to a shin bone and there is the thigh bone of a moa, of Dinornis, the tallest of the moa, and was a, an important and famous figure in his own lifetime. And here was a cartoon of him riding a megatherium. So as the specimens that Darwin brought back in 1856 were studied and described by Owen, Owen found that most of the specimens Darwin had discovered were entirely new species. Uh, they weren't things like megatherium, which was already known. Now, several of them were new types of giant ground sloths. And um, sloths today, we have a couple forms of tree sloths. And tree sloths are sort of the minority within the sloth group. Most sloths sort of run in, in earth history, run from sort of German shepherd size up through elephant sized with basically every size category in between. And of course, if you're much bigger than a German shepherd, you're not going up into the trees very much. And if you're elephant size, you're actually pulling trees down. So we typically refer to these as ground sloths and many of them we call giant ground sloths. So here are three of the forms that um, Darwin discovered and Owen described that were brand new species. Mylodon darwini, you can see Owen named him after the discoverer, Scalidotherium leptocephalum and Glossotherium robustum. And indeed, many more specimens of these have been discovered. So here are more complete skulls or skeletons of these various types of ground sloth. Now, there were bits of armor that had been discovered uh, in South America 
previously, and Darwin himself found some of them as well, some did turn out to be the armor of one of the ground sloths. Mylodon, it turns out, had armor in its skin, little armor plates. But there were integrated armor chunks that had hinted at the existence of a giant armadillo separate from the giant ground sloths. And Darwin actually found the fossils that confirmed that. So these were fossils that when brought back and described by Owen was, was given the name Glyptodon. So you may have already heard, uh, Glyptodon is rather one of the more famous fossil, uh, fossil Cenozoic mammals. Um, you may not have known that actually Glyptodon was a Darwin discovery. So here was an early, this is from Owen's description of Glyptodon and here's you know what a modern uh, reconstructed skeleton looks like. How do we know that, I see in the thing, how do we know that the different fossils are different species as opposed to different breeds? Um, there are all kinds of anatomical differences in terms of the shapes of aspects of the snout, of the brain case, of the joints and so forth that are greatly exceed what we see even among, you know, the diverse breeds of say dogs or cattle. Um, so, um, so there's glyptodont. Subsequently, many other types of fossils of glyptodonts were discovered. And actually in the last 10 years, we've actually the last five years maybe, we have discovered that glyptodonts are actually technically a type of armadillo. They are closer to the fairy armadillos um, and giant armadillos than they are to the nine banded armadillos. Uh, another discovery that Darwin made was the discovery of horses in South America from the Ice Age, from the Pleistocene. Now, as most of you are aware, when the Europeans first arrived to North and South America, there were no horses there. Uh, and indeed, the presence of cavalry was one of the major tactical and strategic advantages of the conquistadors against the uh, various South American and Central American powers. Um, but Darwin found in sediments as the same age as Megatherium and so forth, the teeth of horses. And in fact, here is the same specimen that we see over here in the original uh, lithograph. He gave it the name, Equus curvidens, or rather Owen gave it the name Equus curvidens. Uh, subsequent work uh, confirms that it was part of another uh, species and currently called Equus am amerhippus neogaeus, the New World American horse. And it turns out there were actually several types of horses in North America in the Pleistocene and South America as well. Darwin also found some even stranger fossils. Um, one of these was something that looked vaguely, vaguely like uh, a camel in terms of the structure of the neck, although it had a three-toed foot, not a two-toed foot. Um, and so this was given the name Macrocania, uh, Macrocania the, uh, basically the big llama um, by Owen. And more fossils would be found eventually of this animal. Here, the larger animal here is Macrocania. This is the specimen on display at the American Museum of Natural History in uh, New York City. And here is its skull. And it is not a camel. Now, ecologically, it might have been something like a camel, but it shows some rather distinctive features. For instance, in instance it has a blowhole. Well, rather, the openings for the nasal passage are joined together or, and are on the top of the head. Uh, its tooth structure is rather different than any modern camel. And Macrocania is part of a radiation of strange South American hoofed mammals who until extremely recently were very hard to fit into the family tree of mammals. Now, older reconstructions of Macrocania gave it an elephant or taper-like trunk. And I have to say, at least some researchers uh, think that this is a possibility. However, others suggest that maybe there's something else going on, some form of air sac on the snout or inflated uh, nose structure. And since we don't have the soft tissues, it's hard to say for certain. Excuse me. Now, one of the other discoveries that Darwin made and what he regarded as one of his most unusual discoveries 
Now here's one of the strangest animals ever discovered is Toxodon. And he writes about um, so a, a farm in which there were giant's bones uh, present. He went over there and in this case, he didn't dig it up. Uh, he had to dig into his wallet, but for the price of 18 pence, he got this skull. And this was then named Toxodon platinensis by, um, by Owen. Here is the skeleton. More material was discovered. Uh, and in fact, this is in part the specimen that uh, Darwin discovered on display at the Natural History Museum of London. So what is Toxodon? Well, Toxodon in size is about the size of one of the medium-sized modern rhinos or a hippo, but anatomically is distinct from both of those and is like, like Macrocania, the last survivor of, the, of a once larger group of South American native hoofed mammals. Now, figuring out where Toxodon fits in among the various sorts of mammals was puzzling in the 19th century, and for that matter, in the 20th century. And so when Darwin was talking about his discoveries in The Voyage of the Beagle, written in 1860, his lastly, the Toxodon, perhaps one of the strangest animals ever discovered. In size, it equaled an elephant or megatherium. He's actually exaggerating a bit. It's only the size of a rhino. But the structure of its teeth, as Mr. Owen states, proves indisputably that it was intimately related to the NARS. That's actually the rodents plus, um, plus rabbits. That's actually incorrect. Um, he says in many details, it's allied to the pachydermata and, and other aspects that's similar to the dugong and the manatee. And how wonderfully are the different orders at the present time so well separated, blended together in different points on the structure of the Toxodon. Um, now, we have complete skeletons of Toxodon. Now that's how we were able, people were able to fill in the gaps on that specimen they showed uh, in London um, and, and at other museums around the world. And the South American native ungulates or SANU as they are sometimes called have been problematic in fitting into the family tree of hoofed mammals and mammals in general for quite some time. They clearly show placental mammal traits, uh, but where they fit has been a big problem. Well, thankfully, we now have access to DNA for these particular species, for Toxodon and for Macrocania, which survived until quite late in geologic time. Uh, and additionally, there are some protein evidence from them as well. And you can use this to sort them out on the family tree. And it turns out in a series of recent papers, they come out as close to, but not within, the odd-toed ungulates. Those are rhinos, horses, and tapers. So they're closer to the odd-toed ungulates than they are to the even-toed ungulates, the group that it contains camels and uh, antelopes and cattle and pigs and hippos and whales, because whales are part of that group too. So Darwin made these discoveries, which were fairly significant uh, in his time. And uh, they were displayed after Owen had studied them at the Hunterian Museum, which was the museum associated with the Royal College of Surgeons, at least early on. So this is 1845 uh, from the Illustrated London News. And so here's Glyptodon, here's uh, Mylodon skeleton, and, and other fossils around, as you could see, as well as skeletons of modern animals. Now, eventually, Sir Richard Owen got funding to develop a natural history, history museum for London, the one that's still, uh, still there in, in Kensington. And uh, these specimens got transferred over to the museum there. Now, some people tend to underplay the role of paleontology in Darwin's thinking. But in his notebooks, you can see how vertebrate fossils really helped him come to terms with the reality of evolution. So here he's writing that Cuvier, who was the founder of Fert Paleo, objects to the transpropagation of species, saying, why not have some intermediate forms been discovered between Paleotherium, Megalonyx, that's a North American ground sloth, Mastodon, and the species now living? Now, according to my view, in South America, the parent of all armadillos may have been the brother to Megatherium, the uncle now dead. Uh, and in fact, Darwin got 
this idea of the approaches to reconstructing the family tree of life, right? That any given fossil is probably not the ancestor of something we find later on. The chance of any individual becoming a fossil or even any individual species is pretty small. But instead we can find creatures who have relations to each other with some common ancestor that's even older that we may not have found this, the fossils for. So Megatherium is allied to all armadillos, uh, but is not the ancestor of armadillos or of sloths, modern sloths. And that the common ancestor of both is now long dead. Um, and I think the reason fossils tend to get underplayed by some biologists when talking about Darwin's thinking is that they were not central to Darwin's main big new contribution, which was natural selection. So the fossils weren't really uh, an aspect of the mechanism, but rather additional evidence of the reality of evolution. But he does point out in you know, his intro to the origin later in that, uh, that introductory chapter that I quoted earlier on, he says, uh, in, in considering the origin of species, it is quite conceivable that a naturalist reflecting on the mutual affinities of organic beings, on their embryological relations, their geographical distribution, geological successions, there we are, and other such facts, uh, might come to the conclusion that each species has not been independently created, but has, has had descended like varieties from other species. But then he goes on to say, we then have to find some mechanism as to the understanding of how these transformations could take place. But of course he, and independently of him, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace did hit upon the basic mechanism, which is the reality of natural selection. It's also worth noting that uh, he also found fossils and fossil hunting uh, just an enjoyable thing in and of themselves. As he says, there is nothing like geology the pleasure of the first day's partridge shooting, hey, remember he was from the upper crust, uh, or the first day's hunting cannot be compared to finding a fine group of fossil bones, which tell their story of former times with almost a living tongue. And this is from a letter to his sister. So I do want to point out, um, I didn't do the primary research for this, uh, that there are a couple of excellent books uh, that are available out there. Adrian Lister's Darwin's Fossils, and uh, Sandra Herbert's Charles Darwin Geologist that talk about these particular aspects. And um, just wanted to say, you know, thank you for, for coming here and seeing the talk. I'll have a little time to answer some questions, so that's good. And I wanna point out um, that I have a link and I will put it in the chat after I get through the PowerPoint, but here it is, of online paleontology videos uh, lecture series, podcasts that I and colleagues have put together uh, in case you want to watch more paleo content. Um, and additionally, I've got a bunch of contact info. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Tom Holtz Paleo. Uh, and this information, including my YouTube lecture play, pay, blah, playlist, I will put on the chat momentarily. So let me get out of stop share. And let me grab that information here. And then I will check on the questions. There we go. Okay, so Q and A. Um, but how do we, okay, so how do we know it, Macrocania had a proboscis and not just a blowhole? We don't, as I said, that, that remains a, a matter of debate. Uh, a blowhole per se um, seems unlikely as such, um, way at the top of the head. Uh, there are, those animals that tend to have blowholes are aquatic and they do so because they are trying to breathe without uh, having to surface entirely and nothing, nothing in the rest of the skeleton of Macrocania suggests it's aquatic in any way, shape or form. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of benefit to having your fleshy nostrils at the front of the snout. Most importantly, if you want to sniff your food before you eat it, you just have to go sniff and then bite it. You don't have to go sniff and then turn your head around and bite it like that. Um, but as I said, we don't have the soft tissue, so we'll have to see. Uh, okay, and I see, okay, didn't notice the result proposal. Okay, there we go. Um, 
Would this mean that a small perissodactyl arrived in South America from Africa via transatlantic rafting? That is one of a couple different possibilities. It could have also come in from, from Antarctica, for, from which there was actually a land bridge that existed between Antarctica and South America in the early part of the Cenozoic. Or it could have come across from North America via island hopping, although there was no land connection between North America and South America for much of the Cenozoic. Uh, they were close enough in to each other that there was some exchange of, of organisms in the latest Cretaceous and earliest Cenozoic before they were separated longer term during the middle of the Cenozoic. And we honestly don't really know uh, which pathway the South American native ungulates came from. Okay. Uh, Darwin got chronically ill later in life. This is, yes. I have heard that is either from some tropical disease or it's a hereditary condition, but I'm not sure. Not sure uh, if he, uh, uh, what the current status of the thinking is from that. I know some people have thought it might have been an infectious bite of some sort of, from some sort of insect um, or disease that's transmitted by insect bites. Uh, but others, as you say, have suggested it might be hereditary. It did really um, make him something of a recluse. He uh, tended not to go to, um, to professional talks or professional meetings. He tended to stay back at Down House uh, in the London countryside and people would visit him, but mostly he did correspondence. So he mostly just contacted people via mail. Um, and that's how he kept his, his um, communications going because he was uh, so affected by that. He tried all sorts of, of what they called water cures and so forth to try to deal with that, but nothing seemed to have helped too much. Let's see. Did Darwin have problems with seasickness in the Galapagos? It's well known for rough seas. I will, I can uh, confirm. Uh, that it is known for rough seas. Um, I've been to the, Gala I've been lucky enough to go to the Galapagos six different times. And yeah, it, it, it can be pretty choppy there. I can't remember any specific reference of that, but I'm sure that was one of many places that bugged him from that. Uh, did Darwin have a rival scientist during his fossil research and was said rival a geologist as well? Well, as I mentioned, Darwin's fossil discoveries, he mostly turned over to Sir Richard Owen to describe. So Owen was the one who wound up describing the fossils. Now, Owen and Darwin disagreed later in life. Uh, Owen never accepted Darwinian evolution. Um, and so that was something that uh, they definitely had, uh, were not favorable towards each other in that context. Um, but the primary description, descriptions of the fossils is something that, that Owen wound up doing for him. So how do scientists divide different groups of animals and decide where the split is? Uh, dinosaurs to birds is a link, but how are the divisions decided? Ah, how much change uh, is enough to create a subclassification versus an extreme variant? In modern classification, which actually draws upon a suggestion of Darwin in his chapter 13 of The Origin, is that classifications should be based on patterns of common descent. And in fact, in our modern version of this, you never stop being part of one group, but you can be a subdivision of that. And those subdivisions are ultimately arbitrary on our part, um, often for historical reasons, or there may be some gap in time where we don't have many other fossils in between or morphologies in between at least not yet. Um, but for, exa for example, birds never stopped being dinosaurs. They're part of dinosauria. Uh, dinosaurs, including birds, never stopped being reptiles, or what we formally call sauropsids. They're still part of sauropsida and so forth. I see I've got a two minute warning. Uh, let's see, have the relatives of camels been discovered? Uh, if so, is it known if they had humps? and could go long periods without water. Well, camelids as a group, excellent fossil record. They're a North American lineage. They appear in North America and almost all their history is North American. The South American things like guanacos and daikunias and from them alpacas and llamas uh, are humpless. So humps evolved within modern camelids. Um, 
And so some, some fossil camels probably were dry adapted, but many of them probably weren't particularly associated with dry um, situations. Uh, what percent of the five years did you spend inland and on shore? I wish I had the exact number, uh, but as much as he could, but still, as you saw, that was a travel around the world and on, by sail. So he had to spend a lot of it on, on boats. Uh, I'm reminded that um, we are, oh, we are supposed to, I forgot to post it to everyone here. Here we go. There's the information for everyone. Sorry about that. Um, we are supposed to head on over to Homeland Science on Discord after this. And uh, it looks like I am up against time. So if you've got additional questions, I'll hang out on Discord for a bit. Thank you for coming to Balticon. Thank you for hang hanging out. And I will see you later, hopefully next year in person. Take care.